We're reaching the time of year, at least in my neck of the woods, where there's always the possibility of losing your electricity. It's not too late for storms. As a matter of fact, in just about three days, we have a distinct possibility of storms and dropping temperatures. I don't know about where you live, but there's always a chance of ice storms when that happens this time of year. And losing the heat isn't that uncommon. I, of course, have another kerosene heater, and those of you that have watched this channel for a while know that, but I've purchased another one. Um, the other one has gotten old, a little bit long in the tooth. I'm still going to keep it and use it if necessary, depending on the uh, amount, the temperature outside could be possible that I'd need to to warm the house. Although I would probably would rather only run one and just drape off and close doors of rooms that were unused in order to keep warm. This particular unit is supposed to reduce 23,500 BTUs per hour of heat energy. And it says it'll heat up to 1,000 square foot area. And I'm quite sure that that actually depends on the temperature outside, the colder it is, the less likely it is to be able to heat a thousand square feet. But nonetheless, it says it can heat up to a thousand feet. When I determined which kerosene heater to purchase this go around, I not only considered price, but I considered its ability to be able to adjust the temperature of the unit itself. And I was quite surprised to find out some of the units sold now are not adjustable as far as its heat and temperature. This particular one is, and that's why I purchased it. I'm going to unbox this thing, and like most things anymore, whether you purchase them in store or through mail order, requires some assembly. I'll be back in just a minute. I'll get this thing unboxed, and we'll get this thing assembled. Us being preppers, it, we always know that it's a good idea to have backups and even backups to your backups. I use a central unit, a gas pack, normally for heating and air conditioning, but I also use kerosene as a quick way to have backup heat in case of power outage or an interruption gas supply, which has never happened, but can in case of an earthquake. But I also have a wood stove that I keep out in the garage, and I keep uh, the flue sections uh, well oiled and out in one of my outbuildings. So I actually have three ways to heat if necessary. I really don't want to put wood stove in this house unless it is absolutely necessary. And even at that, it would take probably about three or four hours to get it all installed and installed properly into the flue. So as a consequence, I'd much rather have heat quicker, so I've opted for kerosene for backup heat. As you can see, this particular heater came with the regular part of the unit, the base, the top, and a bail handle, and also part of the uh, cage or guard in these two different places. But I was surprised to find a pump that came with it. I have one. And actually, I'm looking at switching over to using a regular metal can if I can uh, find one, much like the railroads used to use, filling their lanterns. You don't have to worry about those metal cans breaking, and they seldom leak. And even if they do, you can clean them out thoroughly and solder them if uh, a hole does come in it. And it's just more resilient. There's no wonder that in years past, people use kerosene for lanterns and various other items, they uh, used metal cans to fill them with for the simple reason that uh, they're more resilient. You don't have to worry about breakage. It's not that rubber wasn't available to make hoses. Uh, the technology in plastic perhaps hadn't advanced that far back then to have been able to make something like this particular pump. But I have chosen to go with kerosene for backup heat, and I've actually used it for several days, quite a few times over the years, with my other kerosene heater for backup heat 
in cases of power outages. And ice storms this time of year are certainly more than likely going to happen. It's not a rare occurrence here. But I'm going to assemble this particular unit and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. We'll fill it up with kerosene and make sure that it works properly before I store it. Okay, I've installed the front and the back guards or grill as they call it and also the top of the heater itself and the top guard. This particular bell handle was a little bit more open than what I was wanting so I pushed it together and simply put it in right here and slid it over to keep from bending it any more than I have to and springing it back out and then lined it up with the two holes that line up with the top. These little pieces of apparatus are supposed to go on the base and you push it in and what these are for is to keep you from getting your heater too close to the wall and potentially catching a wall or curtains on fire. I'm not going to install these. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of those things like the label on an iron that says to not iron your clothes while you're wearing them. I'm quite sure they, the manufacturer of these, has a good reason for uh, including those. It's additional expense as far as I'm concerned because if you need those guards to keep you from putting a heater or a lantern or anything else, including a candle, too close to the wall, keep burning your house down, then perhaps you shouldn't be left alone anyway. But at any rate, I'm not going to put those on. That's stupid to me. Okay, our last thing to do is to add the batteries to this. And it'll be ready to fuel up and use, which I'll carry it outside, of course, to fuel it up and to start it for the first time, because inevitably um, anything new that burns, like a kerosene heater, stinks quite a bit whenever you first light it. And of course, I don't want that smell in the house. I do want this heater ready to use at a moment's notice. Once I put these batteries in, I'll turn this around and I will open this access door and push this button and make sure that that little element is getting hot. I hope you should be able to see this. That way you know that the lighter is actually working. Another thing I also do is is turn that wick all the way up before I ever put any fuel in it and I'll try it again to make sure that it comes in contact with the wick. In this case, it is. Now, this heater should be ready to fuel up. I like checking for the safety features and the adjustments on anything, especially heaters to make sure they work. The shutoff works just fine. And you can also see there is a range that you can operate this particular heater at. And this is the adjustment range. They, of course, suggest you don't get any further and you're liable to get odor and also soot coming out of it. But you can see you can adjust the range. It won't let you turn it down any further than the lowest part. In order to shut it off, you have to push that button to cut it off. Let's fill this dude up and see how it's going to function. Okay, now that uh, I've got this heater completely assembled, I've got my kerosene out and of course removed the lid. I tried using my old pump, but the seam where this bulb squeezes together or was molded together, it broke. That's why I was 
talking about maybe just getting some other metal type can. You don't have to worry about them breaking. And you know, if things ever get bad, you'll never be able to find anything like that to even buy, even if you had the money. What I'm gonna do is put this nozzle in here, tighten the vent screw down on it, simply get this fuel running in here which it is and I'll keep an eye on this gauge and when it starts getting up closer to full I'll uh, start watching with my eye you don't want to overfill these things uh, whenever you have replaced a wick in your heater or if it's a new heater like this one once you put fuel in it you want it to set about 45 minutes to an hour before you try to light it to give the uh, kerosene time to literally wick up into the wick and uh, be ready to burn. I'm not going to fill this heater up all the way. I'm going to fill it up most of the way, but it's getting dark enough out here that I really can't see down in there and I don't want to leave it long enough to get a flashlight to look. I'm certainly not going to use a match. So once I get it about three quarters of the way full, I'll shut it off and that'll be plenty to uh, get that wick saturated. Okay, that should be about three quarters full, perhaps a little bit more. But I'll let this pump stay out here and air because I certainly don't want it back in the house. And I'll let that, uh, let the heater wick sit there and saturate for, like I said, 45 minutes to an hour. Okay, it's been well over the 45 minutes. I decided to go out and eat supper with my uh, number one grandson, the 17-year-old. So now, since this thing's fueled up, and it's certainly set long enough in order for the wick to uh, absorb all the uh, kerosene that it needs to uh, burn properly, I'm going to uh, start this kerosene heater up. I'm going to let you watch as it starts up. Turn this knob all the way wide open. And then I'll press this start down here at the bottom. As you can see, it's warming up, and the uh, sight glass is fogging up slightly, which is normal for kerosene heaters. Once it warms up, it'll no longer fog up. And the uh, flame hasn't become stable yet, but it will here shortly. I always start these kerosene heaters outside because there's some odor involved whenever you start one up. But also, if your kerosene heater's been setting all summer or it's a brand new heater, it's going to produce an odor because of the uh, either the collected dust from throughout the summer months or it just simply being a new piece of equipment. As you can see, the sight glass is starting to clear off now. And the burner is uh, becoming a lot more stable. A very important thing to do with these kerosene heaters is uh, Whenever they're, they're new, the wick manufacturers suggest after the first couple of hours of burning to let your wick burn completely out wide open, even if you have to set it outside to do that, to clean the wick. And from there on out, about every five days of usage, you need to make sure and let all the kerosene burn completely out. And uh, that cleans the wick. It removes tar and various other deposits, especially whenever the uh, kerosene you're using isn't necessarily that clean. And there has been some complaints about kerosene over the years not being as clean, or one particular type not being as clean as the other. These kerosene heaters are supposed to use 1K, or as we always called it, K1 kerosene. Um, and it's supposed to be a very clean kerosene. 
and it shouldn't leave very many deposits on your uh, on the wick of your heater. If you notice uh, a fair amount of tar deposits or other deposits that just simply shouldn't be on the wick, you know, that's not part of the normal burning process, you probably should find a, another provider for your kerosene. Chances are it's not very clean, it's not as high quality as it should be for these heaters. This has been Bobby with Survival Existence, helping you help yourself. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and come visit us on Facebook. Good day.